Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I can see a couple of new faces. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is RJ. I'm the associate pastor here at TBC or Tungabi Baptist Church. Uh, it's great to have you here today. Uh, before I start preaching or, or sharing what God has to say through his word, uh, let me to say a quick word of prayer. Father, we, we ask that you will not just give us new knowledge or information, but Lord, help us to have wisdom to apply it in our lives. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, as we said, we are going through the Gospel of Matthew, or the story about Jesus Christ in the book or the, the story that's written by uh, Matthew. And we've been seeing just for the last few weeks that this Jew, uh, this Jesus, he was born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem, and he claims to be the promised Savior of the Jews and of the world. But more so, his biggest claim is that he is the Son of God. Uh, now, if you're not a Christian, it's easy to see how this um, outrageous claim, in a way, that it's, it's, it's so kind of bizarre in a way that he's claiming to be the Son of God. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge claim back then, and it's a big claim today. And yet, yet we know that Christianity is one of the biggest turning points in human history. And it's still shaping our society today. Uh, and today I just want to look at some of this implication for us, especially for you individually, that if Jesus is the Son of God, if Jesus is some sort of a Savior of the world, what does that mean for you and for our world? You know, in 1938, a German physicist uh, named uh, Otto Hahn, along with other scientists and other physicists, they made this groundbreaking physics discovery. They discovered that, that by bombarding uranium atoms with neutrons, they found that the atoms actually split into smaller elements. Don't, uh, don't make me explain to you the physics behind that. But it releases, releases a tremendous amount of energy. And the process became known as nuclear fission. Now, it wasn't just a fun discovery, you know, 50, year, 50 or 70 years ago. It wasn't just a fun scientific experiment. But the discovery really changed a lot of things. The ability to split the atom led to a development of new power, nuclear power, providing a more powerful, a more cost-efficient source of energy. Nuclear fission is used for medicine, for scanning, for testing, for cancer treatments. It's been saving lives. And we also know that it's been used to make the atomic bomb, which killed hundreds and thousands of people during World War II and during the Cold War. And today, we're still on the brink, we're always on the fear, on the brink of nuclear warfare. See, one simple science experiment in a town in Germany led to so much implications, good and bad. They discovered power, power to heal, power to change, power to destroy, power to bring electricity to a whole city. And see, in the same way, whether you like it or not, whether you believe in Christianity or not, it has shaped the world. It's still shaping the world today. In it itself is power. See, the first hospitals, the first schools, the foundation of our civil laws, uh, equality, freedom, they all take root in Judeo-Christian religion. That somehow they were all shaped by people who understood and believed in who Jesus claimed to be. And so that's why in the last few weeks, we've been looking at how this new discovery, this, this gospel, this good news, that the Son of God is born how it has changed human history. Now, some, many deny it, others try to stop it, a few believe in it, but in the end, what you do with this information, with this news, is up to you. But you cannot deny its power. Its power is inevitable. And this is why I want to show you what it means for you individually. I'll show you the implication of the arrival of Jesus under three headings, which are, we'll look at it under the new reign, which is his arrival as a king, the new vision, the light that he provides and, and reveals, and new life, his invitation to this kingdom. Okay? The new reign, new vision, and new life. Let's start with the first one, the new reign. So throughout Matthew, the story, and especially at the very beginning of the book, there's this emphasis that Jesus Christ is this king. 
not, not just king of the Jewish nation, but really king of the whole world. That's why, just a bit of a recap for the last few weeks. Remember his genealogy, Matthew 1. We're told that he's from the line of King David. He's the promised king, the promised Messiah. Uh, the Magi, remember in Matthew 2, they were asking, where is the king of the Jews? Because we saw his light. So even the Gentiles are starting to acknowledge who this person is. Uh, John the Baptist says in Matthew 3, prepare the way for him. And again, that's, that's a royal announcement. You prepare the way for the coming king. And so now Matthew 4, Jesus himself says, repent. Why? Because the kingdom of God is here. It has come near. That's the very first thing that he preaches about. The kingdom of God is near. Why? Because he has come. Because he's the king. And so throughout the Gospel of Matthew and other Gospels, Jesus is constantly talking about the kingdom, that he brings the kingdom because he's the king. Now, there has been uh, a lot of uh, theological books written about the kingdom of God, what exactly is the kingdom of God in the Bible, uh, where is it, uh, what, you know, how does it come and all that. Uh, but here's what I think, it's, and it's quite simple. I believe the kingdom of God is where God is ruling. It is where God is in control. And wherever God is ruling, there's peace, there's life, there's order, and there's blessings. So the kingdom of God is basically about the rule of God. And Jesus is saying, God is taking his rule back. God is coming and he's going to be fully in charge once again. He's, he's saying, I'm here to reclaim my complete rule. And this is why last week, we, we saw that the devil is offering the kingdom of the world. He says, if you worship me, I will give you all this, the kingdom of the world. Now, in a way, I don't think he's lying because it, he's right that there is evil. There is suffering and sin and darkness ruling the world. That Satan is somehow, to a degree, he has control. But Jesus says, I've come to take back full control. I've come to rule. And where God is ruling, there will be peace and life and order and blessing. And again, just to recap, and this is why Matthew quotes passages like Isaiah 40. Remember where it says that in Isaiah 40, it talks about that the world is such a mess that someday God himself will bring it to, uh, to right. Uh, he quotes Micah 5 in Matthew 2, where it says that there will be a king in the line of David, and he will come and he will put the world back in order. That he will end war and poverty and suffering, and he will unite the nations of the world. Matthew 2, again, he quotes Jeremiah 31, where it says that God will enter into a new relationship with us. It will be a new covenant, a new agreement that the king will rule over his people, that he will finally deal with all the evil in our hearts, and he will transform us. And in the rest of the book of Matthew, uh, we can see that this, this Jesus, this king, he heals the sick, he calms the storm, he removes uh, demon possessions, he raises the dead. Why? Because it's a sign that he is in complete control of disease, of nature, of spiritual elements, and of life. So that's why his first sermon is really announcing that God is returning to bring complete rule over his creation. In a way, it's a return to Genesis where there's no war, there's no crime, there's no oppression, there's no suffering, there's no disease, no death or decay. And this is why, again, Genesis is such a beautiful and peaceful place because God is in control. In other words, he's in complete rule. And this is why, again, we can see that sin can be defined as human beings trying to take control over God. Sin is saying to God, we don't trust your ways, we want to make our own decision. Sin is a rejection of God's rule, and that's what happened during the fall in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve basically said, we don't trust you, we want to do it our own way. We want to be in control. That's why you can, um, to put this in illustration, you can imagine a great car, uh, the, let's say the, the Lamborghini Aventador. Uh, in perfect condition, and a, a car we can't all afford. Uh, it has powerful uh, V12, well-synchronized engine, well-balanced suspension and, and aerodynamics. It's, it's, it's installed with the, with the latest technology. It's beauty, it's perfection, it's class and power. But imagine the person driving the car is a five-year-old. What will happen? 
terrible things will happen. Bad things will happen to the driver. Bad things will happen to the car. Bad things will happen to the place where the car is being driven. In a way, you can say that there will be destruction and death where that car is. Why? There's nothing wrong with the car. The car is perfect, but it wasn't designed to be driven by a kid. You know, if the Bible is true, and it is, it says that the world was created in perfection, that human life is created in perfection. That's why we have eternal life back then. Eternal blessings and perfection and peace and harmony is available. But we were not created to be in charge of our own lives. We were created to serve God, to love God. We were created to be under his rule and reign. And so when you live your life without God being under your own control, it's basically like allowing a kid to take control of a powerful and perfect car. And that's what we find in Genesis 3. That as soon as human race, as soon as human race turned away from God and said, no, 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 we're going to be in charge. We're not going to listen to you. We're going to put ourselves in the driver's seat of our own lives. As soon as that happened, destruction and death came with it. And what we see in Genesis is that mankind started to, to fall apart, to disintegrate. We fall apart spiritually and psychologically and socially and even physically. It started to fall apart. Why? Because we were built to serve Him. And when we serve ourselves, when we are our own lords, our own masters, our own kings, we're going against the very fab the fabric of reality. We're going against the very purpose of our existence. Let me just give you an example of what can this look like uh, practically. Uh, for example, if, if someone really offended you, if someone really wronged you, what's your natural reaction? What, what's, what's our human reaction? It's, it's to retaliate. It's to get them back. You want to hurt them as much or maybe even more than they hurt, they hurt you. And so you, you gossip behind their back, you make their life harder. Uh, if you can't hurt them back, you, you want to you build up hate in you and you say to yourself how evil and how wrong and how stupid they are. And you, so you build it up. So what's happening with you? You're, you're disintegrating spiritually. Your, your blood pressure builds up. You're more stressed. You can't sleep. You overeat. You're disintegrating physically. And you're gossiping. You're putting others down. You're building a community of hate against this person. You're finding it hard to, to trust other people. See, you're disintegrating socially. You're destroying yourself. You're destroying the community around you, and you're destroying the world. What does God say? What does the king demand? He says, you must forgive. You must no longer, no longer hold this person liable. You must forgive from your heart because only then can you find peace and freedom and health. See, without God, we're just making up the road rules. We're, we're doing what we want for our own best interest. And that's why God gave us his word, his law, his rules, not to restrict us, but to give us life and freedom and blessing and peace and harmony in our lives and in the world. See, Jesus coming in as king means that somehow he will make it possible to forgive regardless of how much we've been hurt. Him being king means that we will be restored physically and psychologically and socially. And when he said that the kingdom has come, what it means that he will enter back so that we will enter back under his lordship and we will start to heal. Things will start to come together. He's saying that the healing begins now. The rule of God starts now in your own life. Do you see? The kingdom of God, it's, it's not just a physical kingdom, although it is. But it is primarily, I believe, the people of God living under the rule and the reign of God as king. And out of that comes life and blessing and eternal prosperity and happiness and so on. See, one day, Jesus will come back and he will usher the new kingdom, a physical kingdom of God. But the first thing he needs to reclaim is his rule 
in our hearts, in our lives. That's the first one. Now, secondly, the new vision, the, the light's revelation. Uh, the second thing that the writer, the gospel writer, Matthew, wants us to understand that this king, he brings in light. He brings light into your life and into the world. Uh, see verse 16, the people living in darkness. What happened? Well, Jesus came and he, they've seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadows of death as light has dawned. Now, again, what does it mean to, to see God as light? Now, there's so many things written about that as well, and I feel like a lot of them can be a bit of speculation. But I believe it simply means that God, through Jesus Christ, reveals the truth. Because light allows you to see, right? When Jesus Christ came, one of his main objectives is to reveal the truth, to, to show you what is reality, especially in our own hearts, the truth of who we are. So one of the ways that God, God's light, the one of the ways that you can tell that God's light has, has really dawned on you is that you start to see yourself in a way that you've never seen yourself before, All right? That's, that's basically how you know that you're a Christian, when you can see and understand your life more clearly. Uh, you know, on Sundays, because uh, I, I leave quite early, and so when I get ready, often my, my wife will still be asleep, and I normally just kind of stumble in the dark because the lights are off, didn't want to wake her up. And I'm sure you've done this before, that when you get ready in the dark, you just grab something to wear, uh, you look at yourself in the mirror in the dark, and you think like, oh, I look fine, and off I go. And once you get to work, sometimes you start to realize, oh, I'm not dressed properly. Like my buttons are not buttoned well, or maybe there's still shaving cream on your ear, or maybe your, your, uh, your fly is open and your hair is all, all over the place and your makeup is all smudged. Why? Because you look at yourself in the dark and you think, I look fine, I look good. But once you walk in the light, only, only then do you realize that everything has gone wrong. Now, what does it mean to be a Christian? That's what it means to be a Christian. When your whole life you thought you're fine, you live your life thinking that you, that you look great, spiritually speaking, but once you become a Christian, you see your flaws, you see your sins, you see things that you've never seen before, that the sins that you've been denying, the, the problems in your life that, you, that you've been making excuses for, now you see them. That is one of the ways you know that God's light has shown in your life, that you can look back in your life and say, and see that everything in a different perspective, that you completely understand what has been wrong in your life. You know, John Newton, uh, he used to sell slaves in the 18th century, and when he became a Christian, he wrote, I was once blind, but now I see. He's saying, I used to think that what I was doing was, was, was a noble living, that it was just an honest work, that I was blinded, but because of Jesus Christ, I can now see. Martin Luther, he was a religious monk. He studied his, the Bible his entire life. He was trained to read in ancient Greek and ancient Hebrew, and even, he even knew Latin. And as a monk, he prayed every day. He gave to charity. He sacrificed his life for this religion. And one day he was studying the book of Romans, and he was wrestling with this phrase, the righteousness of God or the justice of God. And then one day it clicked on him and he said this. He said, and to quote, my situation was that although I was an impeccable monk, I stood before God as a sinner troubled in conscience. I had no confidence that my merit would assuage me or would satisfy, sorry, would satisfy him. Then, and here's the illumination, I grasped that the justice of God is that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy, God justifies us through faith. Thereupon, I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. The whole of scripture took on a new meaning and where is before the justice of God had filled me with hate. Now it became to me inexpressibly sweet in greater love. This passage became to me a gate to heaven. What's John Newton and Martin Luther saying? They're basically saying that the light has shined in their life. Again, that John Newton thought that he was living a, a very honorable job. Martin Luther thought that his religion and his good works was more than enough to satisfy God. But suddenly it revealed to them that they were never enough. 
So many of you probably grew up in church. Many of you went to Sunday school and sang songs every Sunday, even served in ministry as we have been seeing. But unless God has truly revealed to you your spiritual condition, unless the light of God shines in your life, you can know that Christianity is true, but you will never experience that it is real. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, it says that God, He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and He will expose the motives of the heart. Because the very motivation to do good, the very motivation to serve, the very motivation to sit here today in church can be darkness. And when the light of God comes to you, you, will, you can basically say, even the, the good deeds that I do for Him is not for Him. Even the religious things that I do, I don't do it for Him. I do them to make myself look good. I do them to make myself feel better. Or I do them to get the praises of people. Or I do them so that God will answer my prayers. But I only do them for me. But when Jesus Christ came, He came as a king, slowly taking control, starting with our own lives. But to do that, he has to bring light and expose the very reason why he needed to come. He exposes our sins. He exposes our flaws. He exposes our very need for him. And here's the last thing. Here's how we give control to this king. Here's how we can receive the light. Our third point. New life. The kingdom's invitation. You know... He, he had basically one command when, when, he, when he started to preach, which is repent. Now, again, I'm sure you've heard so many explanations or, or sermons on repentance. Uh, even just a few weeks ago, James talks about a repentance that John uh, the Baptist preached. But let me just give you a slightly different angle of, of repentance, all right? Uh, let me take you back in Genesis 3. Because, you know, right after they sinned, uh, Adam and Eve... Uh, they heard God coming, and they quickly jumped into the, into the bushes and, and, and hid. And God says, what's wrong? All right, what, why are you guys hiding? And I mean, Eve says, oh, we're, we're, we're hiding because we're naked. And then God replied, well, who told you that you are naked? God, God is basically saying, you've been naked the whole time. Why didn't you hide before? Like, how did you know that you were naked? How come you didn't know you were naked back then? And here's what's changed, right? Here's what's changed. When they sinned, they couldn't stand being naked, right? Now, now think about this, right? What's nakedness? Like, why are we all clothed today coming to church? What's wrong with being naked when we all know what's underneath, right? See, nakedness is you don't control what people see. Nakedness is you cannot control how people will judge you. We are clothed because we're scared that people will judge us, so we hide under our clothes. Nakedness is, is not having control. That people see all the way in, metaphorically and literally, and we're scared of what they can see. See, before the fall in Genesis 2, mankind did not judge each other. There, there was nothing to be scared of. Everyone looked at each other without sin, without fault, without comparison. They, they were all physically naked, but they were clothed in righteousness and holiness and perfection by God. So again, once they tried to take control of their own life, they suddenly experienced shame. And out of shame comes fear. And out of fear comes anger and hate. See, sin made us remove the righteousness of God, and now we have to put on our self-righteousness. That's why we cover ourselves. Now, think about this. Um, the, the story of Frank uh, Abagnale. Frank, you might have known from, um, from the movie Catch Me If You Can. But it's, it's a real life story. And Frank was basically a master con artist. He pretended to be a pilot, a doctor, a lawyer, and amongst other professions for so many years. And he got away with it. But in his book, he said, he said, on the outside, 
He was confident. He dressed like a pilot. He, he talked like a doctor. He was confident like a lawyer. But deep inside, he said that he's always anxious, always afraid of getting caught. He knew that, you know, that even though he's wearing a pilot's uniform or a doctor's coat, he knew that he's not qualified. So he's always on the edge. He's always anxious. He's scared of getting caught. And so he's always angry at other people. So he tries to hide under a uniform, but it doesn't change who he really is. And you know, some of us here today, you might act confident, but deep down, you know that you're not qualified for it. You might seem confident and competent, but deep inside, you're, you're scared that other people will know the real you. You're hiding, hiding in shame, hiding in guilt, hiding the incompetence. See, you're covering yourself. It might be you're covering yourself with good works. You might be covering yourself with some biblical knowledge. Or maybe you're covering yourself with, with being a perfectionist in life. Or maybe you're covering yourself by working too hard and, 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 and looking good. Or maybe you're covering yourself by, by putting other people down. But whatever it is, you're, you're covering. You're covering your nakedness, your shame. You know you're not righteous enough, not beautiful enough, not complete enough. You're desperately hiding from what everybody else might see, including yourself. And that is why in verse 16, we're living in darkness because darkness hides our guilt, our shame, our fear, our imperfections, and our sins. Now, what does it mean to repent? To repent is to walk into the light, to admit our nakedness, and to ask God to cover us instead of trying to cover ourselves. Repentance is to say, I have been trying to control my life when you should be in control, God. Repentance is to say that I have been living in darkness, thinking that I'm fine, that there's nothing wrong with me, when in reality, I am so scared of being exposed in the light. Repentance is to say that I have been trying to cover myself with my own self-righteousness or with other things in order to find myself when only you, O oh Lord, can give me my self-worth. Repentance is to go to him. And here's how we know that we can trust Jesus Christ, that he can bring the healing, the self-worth, the life that he's promising us. Because Jesus Christ was stripped naked as he was crucified, not just physically, but it's really symbolic that he lost his dignity because he took our shame, he took our nakedness so that he can clothe us with his own righteousness. And in Matthew chapter 27, towards the end of the book, it says that from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over the land. And Jesus cried, cried, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Darkness came on Jesus. The light of the world was plunged into darkness. Now, what's darkness? Again, it's darkness is being separated from God because God is light. And the further we are away from God, the more dark it is. And so darkness is death. Takes us away from the very source of light, of truth, of beauty, and life. And so the ultimate darkness is total separation from God. And on the cross, Jesus Christ took that for our sake. He experienced cosmic darkness. He lost his father. He, in a way, experienced hell. He took on the darkness that we deserve so that he can bring us into the light and not be forsaken. What does it mean to repent? It's to walk into the light, to admit our nakedness, and to ask God to cover us with his righteousness instead of trying to cover ourselves. Now, when you see the truth of who you are and the beauty of what God did for you, it's a lot easier to repent because you no longer need to hide in darkness knowing that you will be clothed in the light of his grace. Church, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious gospel. We thank you that darkness in the, in the end will not win. But Lord, we ask that you will help us to walk into the light, to expose of our sins, our flaws, our lack of self, self-worth, and to know that Jesus Christ did that for our sake, that he gave us his self-worth. 
that now you can see us, O oh Lord, in, in the light, in, in the status of our Lord Jesus, that we are worthy because of Him. Help us, Lord, to understand what that means in our individual lives, we pray. Amen.